Hey guys, welcome back to Break the Mold, episode four. Today we're joined by James the Gale. Only joking, James Gale, still <laughs> legend though. Um, he's the founder of Shogun, Shogun Digital, Shogun Social, Shogun, Shogun Social. Social. We're we're in a middle phase right now, and he's changing. Yeah, the, the website URL needs to change. We'll talk about that. Don't worry. No, we'll, we'll touch on that. But no, J- James is a uh, remarkable lad, you know. And you know, we've we've probably only known each other now. Probably, is it even a year? I don't know, it feels like more, to be honest. Mm. Yeah, like, well, it feels like more because that social bomb we got on LinkedIn. Mm. But like, I think we've actually been like talking yeah, for about kind of to a year now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But remarkably incredible chat, highly intelligent. And, you know, he's the products, his business, the products. Would you say you're a COVID baby? Oh, Is yeah, that definitely a pandemic baby, yeah. Pandemic baby. So, <laughs> we'll, so we'll touch on that. And I think, you know, one of the things, is, there's a few things, that kind of few routes I want to go down today, James. So first of all is your story, of course. Mm. You know, I want to learn, I want, I want you to kind of explain to our guests what you've been through so far because growing a business in COVID, that's huge, so well done. Thank you. And also want to talk about your views on organic social and things that I suppose, especially B2B brands are doing wrong right now. Yeah. And then also as well, I want to plug a USB stick into your head just in terms of where you think the future is going to be touched on metaverse, etc. Yeah. So let's dive straight in. So so talk to us about, let's talk Let's talk before Shogun. So let's, what, what got you to the point of running Shogun? So I was in marketing three or four years before I started this anyway. Yeah. So I'd, I'd work with brands like, can I name drop brands on here? Yes, you can. Yeah. B&Q, HSBC, <laughs> Samsung, um, <Perfect>. you know, <laughs> stuff, stuff like that. Like, so it was, it was a mix between corporate, large scale, and then I worked, worked with a lot of smaller, medium sized businesses. But like at every stage, no matter who I work with or, or what campaign, no one's taking social seriously. Mm-hmm. And it was just boggling me because I'm opening up my phone and I'm looking at creators outperforming large scale businesses at every stage who did it in their bloody bedroom. I'm like, could we just tweak it a little bit <laughs> and take it seriously? And then the, the last last agency I was in, pandemic hit, working by myself. I'm in my room and I'm fuming because I don't do well with having to work in my house. So I'm just like, how dare I have to work in here? Um, <laughs> so I was just like, you know what? If I'm gonna have to work from my house, I'm gonna have to work for myself. Yeah. So I took, went on Fiverr, Got, got clients off of there, enough to replace my salary, and you just quit straight away. No savings, no nothing, just went for it. Uh, and then, you know, it's, it evolved, started more as just a social media, let's see how we can help you both paid and organic. And then yeah. as it evolved, and as TikTok rose during the pandemic, and as authenticity rose, and people got sicker and sicker of corporateness everywhere, uh, I realized that the gap was helping businesses bridge that gap and post more like creators and breaking into podcasting and TikTok and everything else because that's what people are digesting. It just made no sense not to fill that gap because no other agency had done it thus far. Maybe there's some, but it would, uh, in my research, I'm yet to discover one that does what step for step what we do. So it went from me in my bedroom to now a team of five going on six a year and seven months later. That's awesome. And so, so talk to me through then. So, so you, you set up Fiverr, as in like all your ads on there, et cetera, mm. for jobs. Like, at what point was it literally like right I'll, I'll wait till my income's been replaced from five and then I'll jump ship yeah I had like four clients two three hundred quid each yeah yeah done so literally enough to live on and yeah. I'm gonna take the jump mm-hmm. yeah, and, how, and how, when did you know that was the plan like was was, was five or like let's just at the start let's just make some some side hustle peas yeah or like or what no plan is a strong word my friend uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm more luck I've always had this dream of running a creative agency anyway yeah um, but it just kind of evolved into it. And I started seeing larger and larger scope and I started seeing where we could sit in the market. And once I'd already found we had product market fit anyway with the f- just filling the gap, because even in virtual networking, I, I came across a lot of social consultants, but on specific platforms, especially like LinkedIn, there's plenty yeah. of people that can help you with that. But no one's fulfilling it because it's very hard to get clients involved in that sometimes. I think it's because they'd run into the barrier of someone who wants to just get rid of their social and they don't value it. Whereas I took the hard stance of going, and I really value this. This is this needs to be the first part of your strategy, not the last. And I will not work with you unless you value it. So that yeah. kind of rose and gave us a little specialist pocket to sit in. What, if you what, need to really go social first, you come to us. Yeah, and what, why do you think that is? Why do you think businesses just like to, or even individuals within businesses, just want to get socials just off their hands? And like, is, is, is it just something else that we can automate? Do you think it's business owner mindset where it's like, how much of the business can we automate yeah. and designate? It used to be a massive trend. Like, think about, cast your eyes back before the pandemic, how many automation tools were out there and how many were we using? Think of all the Zapier integrations, think of the HubSpot integrations, mm. think of how marketing tried to be streamlined and how marketing itself is being pushed as this one-stop shop robot can do it for you, get leads in the door, just pay money and things happen. 
Like people were so used to not putting any effort in that when people's attitudes changed in the pandemic, it left them on an island. Like the the age of automation is ended and the age of authenticity is in. That's how I tend yeah. to tend to phrase it because we all know it. We're all sat there in our bedrooms on the same Zoom call that our CEO is. We are now level pegging. For me to interact with this ad that's clearly got no effort into it, do I? No. Mm. I can see straight through the corporateness and TikTok is a big driver of that because it is fundamentally... Can I swear on here? Yeah. yeah. A fuck you platform. That's what it is. <laughs> it, it is just that I don't care what I, I... I'm sick of being Instagram perfect. I don't yeah. care about what my nan's doing on Facebook. I'm just going to have a laugh. Yeah. Do you think some of that TikTok uh, authenticity is starting to spill into the other platforms now? Or do you think there's, they're just not, not changing? Every platform has had to... Yeah. Keyword, pandemic, pivot. Uh, every <laughs> single one of them has had to change. So Instagram, Reels. Facebook, Reels. Pinterest, Watch Tab. Um, the only people that have not introduced it are I think LinkedIn and Twitter yeah yeah. now imagine how much of an impact you have to have to make platforms essentially completely change if you open up Pinterest right now it looks identical to, pin- to uh, TikTok mm. just two sections on it now mm. people will try to steal the mould it's just yeah, it's yeah. perfect in the way it was but done is it, is it too little too late yeah mm. like people they, they, each platform had a specific use case already People from Pinterest are going, I hate Pinterest now. Like, if anything, that's a good addition for them. It's still seen as a copycat thing to do. And each and every one of them are like three to f- three weeks to a month behind TikTok. So eventually, when you start liking the content, you are going to go to TikTok first and leave behind the old crap mm-hmm. until you start developing your own creator economies in these different things. And that's what these other platforms don't have. They don't have a strong creator economy. They just have the feature, yeah. which is not enough. It's like we were speaking about the other day, wasn't it? Like, how many new features of Facebook try to introduce mm. to their platform like, oh, must be you, like you open up Facebook even on desktop or whatever just like look <laughs> on that left hand side like it's, 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 par- it's paralysing mm. hmm. it's like where do you even start even as a creator like where, where do you even start you know you don't mm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> to give you some perspective year and seven months in we're about almost 500 followers on Instagram 730 on LinkedIn and then we haven't gone as hard as TikTok as I'd like to but that we've stayed posting the exact same content mind you we stayed as the same 63 people i invited for my friends list on facebook in that entire time yeah they do not care about you they just want your ad money and that's why i'll it's never so care about them but now what do you one thing that's quite interesting because you know, i remember the glory days of facebook especially when i was promoting the clubs back in the day oh back in the day like, when, when, when facebook reach. groups mm. were like got through the roof there, yeah. Mm. Like, you know, all you, all you need to do is create a Facebook group, get all your audience in there, one post, bang, the majority of people are going to see that, and they killed killed it, killed it, killed the organic yep. reach. But, like, do you think now that they'll they'll bring back organic reach because people just naturally flock to these other platforms? We may see that with the introduction of Reels. So this is exactly how Inter- Instagram's counteracted it. Uh, Instagram got to an extreme plateau where you had to dedicate two to three hours of full engagement and create really engaging visual experiences to grow in any way, shape or form if you were B2B, right? If you weren't just a a creator. Um, But with the introduction of Reels, you now can have that really nice visual element of it, but also they give you reach to an audience because people on Instagram will find it that they could only ever get to the people that are already following them. And you had to go through some crazy algorithmic gymnastics to even hope to reach new people. And this is why the complicated hashtag strategies were a thing. So you had to get your full 30 and then put them in, in like priority and niche order and make sure you had like your top three to five prioritized from an SEO point of view. They introduced alt text for images. You had to write and describe each one. And when you had to go through all of that, it was a nightmare. But Instagram... I think are going to see success with reels and already yeah. are because people are starting to create specifically for it in aesthetic style videos back to like Instagram's OG days uh, and it just lets you reach new people for once yeah. which you've never done before so even though it's a copycat feature I do appreciate it on Instagram because yeah. it works we'll see if Facebook has the same effect but I've uploaded two so far and they've done no such thing so yeah, we'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll see what happens and, and so how does this all translate into the business world so like for example like I think I think first of all, you know, we I think back to what we said, you know, pivot, buzzword mm. of the pandemic. Love it. And you you're know, on mute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're on mute. Yeah. Like what, what what like authenticity as well, that word gets chucked around everywhere these days. Aye. And some of the people that I think say they're authentic, mm. you know, we were talking about a few the other day, mm. like they're not authentic. No. So so first of all, like, what is your definition of authenticity? My definition is whatever the definition of that person wants to be. Yeah. <laughs> it's just I actually you said wants to be not yeah. is is wants to be you know grammar uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it is literally you know there are some people who aren't comfortable sharing them online what do you think that is 
there's a lot of psychological elements that go into social, which is why it's the underlying reason why yeah. a lot of business owners avoid it. I think a lot of business owners have the dream of being the rich CEO that no one's ever seen before. Mm. They, like, they can enjoy their wealth without getting in people's face. Like, I think a lot of people's worst nightmare is ending up like Elon. Like, yeah. I don't, I, even if you offered me Elon's position in life, I'm not sure I'd take it because it's just horrendous how much he's in the public eye, right? So I think a lot of people have that stress around it. There's a lot of psychological issues, whatever your background is. You know, when you start to post on social, put yourself out there, you're putting yourself at risk. And, you know, Stephen Bartlett said it many times, you have to be, you have to risk someone calling you C-U-N-T if you want to succeed. And, you know, for me, I was just like, I'm going to do what others want to succeed because I'm just an absolute madman. But, you know, you don't have to take that path. There are other ways you can use social media uh, and be yourself in different ways. So I often tell people, yeah. like, like, if you don't want to put yourself out there, express yourself in visuals, express yourself with the written word. But if you're going to do it, do it consistently and do it often and do it well. Which and then when you're thinking about writing blogs that often, you're like, oh, bloody hell. Because yeah, yeah. organically speaking, that's not what these platforms want right now. And that's the tricky part. You kind of have to bend your will slightly to the platform while somehow still being yourself. So it is hard to do, but it is entirely possible. Yeah. Where, where do you want to take Shogun? I want this to be the largest native social media agency in the UK. So if you're thinking of building a real community or like a real creative focused social first brand, you come to us. And we help you get in the trenches and make your day-to-day -day stuff. That's what I want us to be. Yeah. I want us to be that go-to brand. And then eventually you know, build off a sub brands. So they'll be Shogun paid if you do need ad, ad campaigns that build off of a strong organic foundation. Because a lot of brands don't have that. Where your ads will perform 10 times better if they have a strong organic foundation. Because people already like you. They already care. When they see an ad, it's not an uh, ad. It's, oh, those guys again. Yeah, like, yeah. That perception needs to change. Um, so eventually I'd like to build out different sections. And just see how it goes. And in another part of the business called Shogun Creators, which I want to build a entire list of people that want to be creative full time, but don't have a following and they want to be creative for a living and find the brands that are starving to have a face to their business yeah. because they aren't comfortable putting themselves out there and match the two together. They can agree a cost and just work. Yeah. Create that stuff every single day and build a parasocial bond between that band, that brand and that person. And that person doesn't have to work a corporate nine to five to live. Yeah. That's do you, do you, I don't know if this is controversial, but like, do you think um, a, there's a bit of a generational thing at play here when it comes to mm, authentic content? Because, for example, like, you know, and, and this is it's generally a stereotype, it's just more for just a kind of spot of discussion, but mm. like, I think when we first came into business, even in the last kind of like five, six years, and maybe even before that, like, there was a perception of like, this is your work self, this is your work self. So it's almost so like you always been. The authentic way is actually what you like at home. That's your that's your authenticity because mm. you're not trying to be anyone. You're not trying to play a character. And then you come to work and you put on the work mask, and we almost like leave our emotions at home. Yeah, we're very robotic, etc. But what I found is even those that I think who who kind of position themselves and say they are authentic online, mm. let's say they post like LinkedIn videos, for example, like you can still see they can't drop the barrier. LinkedIn's they can't the drop the mask, mm. you know. And then, no matter how much you say, like, look, just relax. Mm. It's like Yep, so we're from, my name's Tom from XYZ Company, and mm. we help clients. It's like... Yeah, it takes ridiculous practice. But is it practice, or is it just like making a decision that I'm going to be who I'm at home here? Kind of, because your delivery matters. It's like when you're when you're making social content, yeah. especially if it's sit down, just me in front of camera, that's extremely difficult to a setup, compared to a setup like this. This is why any first client who wants to get into video, I'm like, you start podcasting first because it warms you up, it gets you into a conversation, gets you into a flow, and it doesn't paralyze you when you look down that lens. It's a bit like a gun, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit like, <laughs> even I forget everything I've ever known when I look down the camera and I was like, what was this video on again? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Uh, so it can, it's just a natural part of creating content, and this is why you have to find your voice in how you do things. Even if it starts without video, yeah. make audiograms, make those little snippets, but just put the value that you know will help out there and communicate in a way you'd communicate to your friends. Um, it, generational things will play into it. Like, I always think of it as the work mask came about because it was a necessity. But if we really took the clock back and asked everyone of that generation if they would prefer the work mask or what Gen Z are trying to implement now, they would choose authenticity in themselves. 10,000%. Mm. It's because it's just the way the world has been, but then this generation's gone, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. Yeah, for sure. Mm. You know, one of the things we talk about here when we're we kind of like discussing strategy, it's actually using our framework. One of those big elements is what we call human positioning, where we think bigger companies need to be 
giving their people permission mm. to go out in the marketplace, almost like grow their own personal brands, etc. Get people to know who they are. You know, get get up close and personal with their team. Yep. But sometimes what we find is there's almost like a fear that they get too good at it, and as a result, they that their star employee builds a huge audience mm-hmm. at companies' expense because technically they brought us in to consult to kind of make it all happen. Yep. And then person leaves takes audience with mm-hmm. so like do you do you think that large organizations who've maybe got hundreds of thousands of employees especially i suppose those b2b orientated who yeah. you know being present on linkedin for example over and over and over again more frequently yeah like do you, do you think there's a challenge there where they're like oh, but a they won't do it or b well yeah. they won't do it basically it it's it depends on what you want them to achieve so if you're trying to get them to build a personal brand that will solely benefit the business they're working for that's going to build resentment. But if you get them to grow and develop as a person that has clearly contributed to that business, if they do go on to start their own thing, it should be an applauding moment. All jobs should be seen as, as step ladders, as rocket ships to somewhere else. Like the days of pretending that you want to work somewhere until the day you die is gone. I say in yeah. every interview I ever have, like, first of all, don't you don't have to, this isn't that like that, right? Um, and if a brand's like, you have to post specifically just for our benefit, then of course they're going to meet no or they're going to meet all right sure but i'll have my own master plan going on um so i do encourage brand advocacy absolutely but this should be more of a collaboration with your employees not a forced mandate and that's probably where a lot of companies have gone wrong with it if they've attempted it before yeah it's very interesting and so so kind of like when we talk about i suppose the future of marketing specifically on the b2b side Mm. like where do you see it going relationship building trust building uh, over the pandemic specifically, and I think this is this has happened in general even beforehand. The the borders between sales and marketing are very blurred, and they need to be separated. Marketing is demand generation for a product or service. Sales is bringing the money in, and social has emerged as its own thing. And they now need to work as a holy trinity. You build trust here, you build the demand for it here in combination with this, and then the sale finishes it off. But right now or even before the pandemic, it's just smushed into one thing. So any kind of activity that may fall under the banner of marketing mm. has ROI expectations that are unrealistic for the platform it is. Yeah. And you know, immediately in every call I ever have with anyone, I have to go take a step back, realize that we're gonna be working at this for the next one to two years. And that's just the reality. You have to earn it, you can't skip it. Performance marketing will not get you there no matter how hard you try, it will just pump up your vanity metrics. Real engagement, real community is not bought, it is earned. And you have to know that and you have to have the pocket of cash for that because ultimately the ROI for that is 10x on the other side. And that could probably be more powerful than the other two. But these two need to be an existing, well-rounded function before you start this. Yeah. And this is probably why we're, we're quite a niche organization because we're like, T, you've got your shite together. We can't work with you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Because yeah. I can't have organic social be your main driver of leads. It's become ours but after a year and seven months of effort. So unless you're going to join me in that task first, I can't I can't magic up for you. So especially you, if you're you starting must from have scratch. some tricky conversations with MDs because like, you know, majority of MDs I speak to like, you know, there's usually kind of two things. Like either A, they just want to get it completely off their plate, they don't want to look at it. Mm-hmm. Or secondly, they're like, when's the ROI coming? Yeah. So we start working with you today, we can expect an ROI when? And I, I tell them either get out or... <laughs> Or they often quite, I've, I've found it surprising. I think post pandemic, people know it's changed. Yeah. People know that it's a challenge that kind of beyond their remit. I mean, it's why companies like mine exist and a lot of other larger like social agencies and paid social agencies are, are rising throughout the pandemic. It's because it's, it's needed, it's different. And you have to recognize that because, you know, GDPR changes wiped out a lot of a lot of data for companies. Um, Google were getting rid of cookies in 2023. Facebook's ad changes have completely wrecked remarketing in the way that is. Um, when you really look at it, you need organic now. It, you can't ignore it anymore. So you might as well invest the money in it for the long term. We're used to long term investments with the like you know investing in the S&P 500 or long term crypto, whatever it is. We're used to that, but you need to treat your brand in the same way. Mm. I don't know why it's not mixed in with brand building more often, but it is. For me, it's the most important element of brand building because that's the everyday fight in those in those DMs yeah, and those sure. comments every day. Because people see you putting in the effort. Yeah. If you post once a week, people tell you don't care. Yeah. If you still got Adobe stock written in the bottom left of your <laughs> your image, you know, they don't care. And I love when I see that. Yeah. And it's or it's, even they like try to fade out the watermark. <laughs> Is that come yeah. on? I see that. Or put their logo on top of it. Or you hear like, or you hear like a video in the back. You hear audio jungle. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> sort of stuff a mixtape yeah. Maybach music yeah <laughs> so it's, it's just the way it is and you know a lot of MDs have accepted that challenge and they know it's about building the brand yeah so yeah. if you come to us for direct ROI I will send you to a lovely company like yourself or someone else. But yeah. if you're looking for real long term a relationship with an audience and don't think of the line, think don't think of them as customers, think yeah, audience, yeah, yeah, yeah. then that's where we step in. Yeah. And what about companies though, for example, like do you think every sector has an opportunity in organic social? Mostly. Because for example, let's say I suppose random examples like um we were speaking to like a I think it's like a glass the glass glass recycling engineers. Mm. whatever that means yep and the the people that they were targeting were a worldwide but b could only be found they, they're not it wasn't really like a social media kind of mm-hmm. uh, same way to describe it like they, they, you can't find these people on linkedin you can't really find these people on social so for example if you don't know if you know who you're targeting but you don't know what platforms they're on like how, how do you get in front of them on an organic social kind of perspective without having to default to the old traditional methods where it's like prospecting on the phone mm. or direct mail campaigns and all that kind of stuff yeah again you need that function to reach very specific people like that but then you need to start making content that doesn't it doesn't go out to find people where it tracks and mm. this is where you go listen my customer profile is 60 year old male he like lives in a nice house quite reclusive doesn't believe in social too much but he'll probably have a facebook and he'll probably have a, a linkedin okay cool what do they find entertaining inspirational educational and how can we then slip ourselves into that niche like that that is how we should be thinking of it and then just attracting them in ways that we we wouldn't think yeah. possible that's what so I for me when i hear that we'll be, I, yeah we before we before you'd be forced to like fall to facebook and bloody start putting some money into it right mm. because yeah. like back we were saying like how, how hard it is to grow organically on facebook it's a nightmare yeah, no, it, and it they is, sort themselves out with these reels. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard, and that, again, that part will take a long time. You're going to need yeah. to have the marketing still doing its work, but then when they do find you and they do discover you and they're trying to consume more of you, figure out if they can trust you, that's where social media comes in in a big yeah. way. Because I, I think often, especially in marketing, that website has been put at the top of that list to go. CRO so UX is this is how this is where all the nurturing and conversion happens. Yeah. It's like, no, if this is especially if it's a high level B two B service cost or anything else, I'm snooping everything about you before mm. I make a move. How many touch points can you get in the social side to actually go, man? This company is about it. Like this is the only glass specialist company I know of yeah. that's putting in this effort. And think of that as if it's a specialist, like I can't even think of them being on social. That could be your largest opportunity to be on social yeah, so because true. it's unclaimed yeah. territory. And when I when I think about some of the biggest opportunities we've had in our business, it's all from when we've been on the ball with posting mm. on the ball like we, we, we've had you know clients that we work with who didn't realise we were, we were connected, to, connected with them for a long long time yeah. never liked anything never commented on anything then all of a sudden one day they come out of nowhere bang in the pipeline hello client and yeah. we're talking as if we're like best mates all it takes right, is one it's, it's almost like the ghost following mm-hmm. like who like, live in the shadows who 80% of videos watch without sound yeah. so you will not get any analytics on 80% of your audience yeah massive, picture right? that I think the, so, the, one of the main issues is it's, it's intangible you can't measure it you can't measure yeah. someone yeah, watch, for sure. looking at a piece, piece of content and not interacting with it yeah. Yeah. I think that scares a lot of people it does yeah. But ultimately, you're missing out on all of it anyway because yeah. you're not doing anything. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah. You know, and, and I think sometimes the, the the hard thing to like, I suppose, communicate and maybe educate our clients on is like, this is not an, not an overnight gig. Like the, the analogy we use is mm. like, for example, like we, we all that organic social piece. Like for me, falls in that long term marketing growth. Right, mm-hmm. this is stuff that will give you the results tomorrow or in yeah. the future. And then, unfortunately, the way the world works, if we're going to invest in marketing, we want an ROI. Blah, blah. Mm. So we're forced to kind of position and engage yeah. on what we call short-term sales activation. Yeah. And that's your traditional lead gen routes, whether it's emails or mm. paid ads or whatever that all is. Still SEO, complete necessity, yeah. So, so still, like, the, the, the challenge of that is you go through peaks and troughs of that working. Mm-hmm. You might have three great months, two awful months, one great month, one awful month, etc. Yeah. Consistency can be tricky on that. Mm. You know, but then also it's like you need to, it's almost like you need to perform so well with the short-term sales activation activities to get it's almost like you're ch- and you're chasing your tail with that long-term marketing growth stuff kicking in yeah because it's almost like if you get if you can get to that place where short-term marketing growth short short-term sales activation marries up with the activity of long-term growth mm. that's when you hit the holy grail and you've got a client for life yeah you um, have me yeah absolutely and it's i think any business that's large scale at the moment has done it that way and this is i i have to be quite challenging with a lot of the mds i talk to and i go look look at think of any successful brand right now 
did they do it for the long term? Yes. Okay, why are we having this discussion? It, so true. If you want if you want to be there, you have to make the sacrifices and investment. And it comes back to the whole sales and marketing are too much merged. And we need to separate them slightly yeah. to give realistic timeframes for agencies. It's so true. ads and short-term activation is not as easy as it used to be because sure. of how often things are changing. And people, especially, especially if you had a bad experience with an agency before, your expectations of the next one yeah. are so high that it, it's going to be impossible. And you'll, you'll see them like, oh, I've had talked to like four agencies before and they couldn't get the job done. I immediately yeah. want to hang up. I'm yeah. like, there's no way I'm going to be yeah, able to, true. to yeah, do it's anything. It's so true. It's like, yeah, well, they're, they're absolutely right. It's a red flag because if they've worked with four other agencies, there's only one or two things going to happen. Mm. Either they were incredibly unlucky and came across the four worst agencies in the country, <laughs> or B. Or they might be the issue. Or, or yeah. their, their marketing head, or the, the, the screws just aren't like, the, yeah. the lights which hasn't flicked on. Yeah, and it, you know, it, it's, to, to understand the modern day marketing function, what's required to help yeah. that succeed. It's an education piece. Like yeah. one of the things, especially in mind being one of the most like unexplored things and newest areas. Uh, when I'm especially when I'm talking to large corporate teams, I'm starting with before I've even like I may have done a proposal or initial conversation. I'm like, look, let me come in and do a training session for your entire team. Let me spend an hour going through what is social now and let you see the gaps. But bring in every stakeholder that may not agree with it yet and let them see the light first and then afterwards you go any questions because i want you to all feel as involved with this as possible and that for me has been the big driver of actually getting these larger scale corporate transformations going because everyone feels involved and everyone now sees the reality and if they don't after that then that's the red flag i need not to be there yeah. but ultimately it's really helped and although it's sacrificing my time this is why i always bring a camera around with me so i can capture that content it's going to yeah. be a win for me anyway because I'm either going to get my best moments or I'm going to win a client and yeah. get my best moments. And, you know, we need to treat everything like a win-win scenario and that's been the best driver for me to get around that. Yeah, that's nice. And so, like, you know, looking at this, so I know we spoke a little bit before we came on the show with, like, mm. talking about metaverse and all that. So it is that word. Dark art. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so you know, we, I say, Chris, Chris and I have invested in some digital assets on Earth too. <laughs> Whether they're going to be worth anything or not, I don't know. Yeah. But like you know, so 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 first of all, to anyone who doesn't know what metaverse is, yeah, you know, I'm not supposed to be like a complete expert on it. But do you want to just give your description of what metaverse is to anyone watching this, thinking mm. I've heard of metaverse, but I don't actually know what it is? Yeah, I think it's probably like there's one jump too far when people start with the metaverse. So we need to take it a little bit further back. Uh, it's all based on blockchain tech. Blockchain is like we're in Web 2.0 now. Slash new, yeah, we're in Web 2.0 now. The internet is based in like a server underwater somewhere. That is like a central place for the internet. The idea of the blockchain is to take, turn people's computers into mini servers so the entire world is the internet, right? And that then decentralizes the internet itself and allows things to be more easily tracked using blockchain tech because they have like little ledgers, like little wallets to track everything. Uh, and then it allows different things to be made on that. It's built on the foundations of the blockchain. So this is why things like new decentralized currencies are arising because it's all possible. It's all more in the hands of the people. Meta's move on that is to create the metaverse and go the new way we'll digitally involve ourselves in the world of blockchain and crypto entirely is via this interface. That's what they're trying to do. So anyone's read Ready Player One, that's exactly what they're trying to do, which is very dystopian and very scary to me because that literally means Mark Zuckerberg owns the internet if you want to put it in that respect. Um, it has a massive potential to be the way we interact with everything. Museums, content, people. You know, if anyone's ever seen like VR chat, if anyone's ever seen gaming and stuff, like the way we can interact and be whoever we want, where we want, go see what we want, and own things that others might not be able to own, is all based off the back of the blockchain, and then that centralized place where you go and visit it in the metaverse. Now, the debate is whether that, whether Mark can create Marky the one, Mark, Marky Mark can create the one Mark. place, yes, where everyone wants to go. Yeah, and can he get the tech in enough people's hands for it to be usable? Yeah. So imagine so, you're going to need a headset yeah. for it. Mm. So how many how many people are going to buy a 300 pound headset for something that may or may not take off? Yeah, yeah. That's but the challenge. I, I think has. what will happen is obviously with you know well, how does Facebook make the money, right? Mm -hmm. Paid ads. So That's where all the money's going. So they're going to create so much ad revenue opportunity in that yeah. platform mm. that they'll be they'll be giving away the headsets for free. Yeah, cyberpunk mass mass usage. Yeah, cyberpunk, Blade Runner, Ready Player One is the metaverse. Yeah, a, as scary and dystopian as it is, they will be selling ad space on anything. Basically, so, they're yeah. trying to sell people's visuals like field of view 
to ad space. So let's look at the positives and negatives to that because, mm-hmm. I mean, I can already have, I've got a list of negatives in my head, which probably actually outweigh the positives, I'm being completely honest. Yeah. But what are, you, what, what are the goof, what are the positives to Metaverse, in your view? New digital human experiences. Yeah. It's going to unlock stuff that we can never think of and experience things we'll never get to experience in our entire life and give it to people that may not have ever been, had the funds to ride the waves in Hawaii go you know, swim with the dolphins like you may not be there be there but it's the closest you could get and it puts access into the hands of people that could have never had it before yeah that for me is is like the good part about it and i think if not <coughs> if one person didn't own it one company i'd be way more comfortable with the yeah. idea if this was again a decentralized where we all interact with it then i am just so 100 percent for what, it what scares you then about facebook or meta owning it they get to control the rules of the internet the entire Web 3.0 revolution slash fourth industrial revolution, they own it. Like the, the speaking of which, you know, Google technically owns Web 2.0. When we think about it, everything's mm. being Googled. That means one company controls the internet as we know it right now. And it's not technically. I'm not sure we're ever going to get away from it when I really no. think about it. And I have a little dawn moment here. But you know, it's but have you not used our streams. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard that in years. I'm joking. Duck, does, duck, is that, does that even still exist? Yeah, it must do. I think it got bought up by Yahoo or something. Well, ask. Mm. Yeah, was, was it ask.com? Yeah, ask Jeeves. They've yeah. all been bought if up. I, if Ask Jeeves or Yahoo appears in my browser, I'm like, oh, I've got a virus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What a shame, right? <laughs> but yeah, I mean... Or Bing. Yeah, or Bing. <laughs> to be fair, Bing, B2B service providers, don't sleep on Bing. You can get a much cheaper cost per click via yeah, Bing. Yeah, huge. Um, so, you know, because it's everyone's default browser in corporate places yeah. mm. so don't sleep on it but yeah it's it's a scary thing it has so much potential and I just want it to be used in the way it was intended with decentralised tech and blockchain because the idea uh, is you can check anyone's activity what anyone's ever bought uh, and it's truly open and honest mm. but I don't think that's the way it will go it seems go. like we're working so hard to decentralise everything Facebook's coming in and trying to centralise it yeah I mean, we've been scarred already once with Facebook, yeah. like the actual platform. Look mm. what happened with that. Yeah. You know, they spread it out for free, and then they start restricting everyone. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's what we're going to do in the metaverse. Possibly. That, that's it's entirely thing. in their hands. That's yeah. the thing, because Facebook, like, I really do think Zucks started Facebook with good intentions. Started Facebook mm. with good intentions. Mm. Maybe, I, I still believe that Facebook has a, as a as a social machine, I think it's outgrown him it, I think it's outgrown itself in what it's it kind of means itself. to the entire yeah. world I mean, yeah. no one could have seen it coming and that's why no matter what tiny micro chasm thing they do has extreme ripple effects in the entire world any new feature any slight update any delay and that time it shut down yeah. oh my god the marketing world went nuts yeah. uh, it, it is one of the lifebloods of the internet as we know it today and no one really saw that coming, but you know <laughs> we have to adapt and uh, live and live with that. And yeah. it's done a lot of good still. Think about how many people know and be, are connected with others and mm. have just it's had positive experiences by the fact that Facebook exists. I can never take that away from them. And obviously, I did. I was an avid Facebook user at some point, but I don't like it when it's clear that someone's objectives are somewhere else, and they're like, "This is a pure profit-making machine for what our next mm. thing is to own the interwebs." Mm. Um, but it's like, like, it's, it's like for it. me, it's like the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal, right? Like, about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like that—that that was almost like the turning point where, when you start to influence people's decision making mm. based on thousands and thousands of data points yeah. on what you're likely to, what, like what decisions you're likely to make based on content that's put in front of you yeah based on demographics psychographics likely upbringing likely political party likely all this that and the other it almost becomes like a, a very dangerous place of manipulation right but isn't that google ads right now mm. yeah and many other ad platforms yeah. as well think of large media corporations that have like all the companies you didn't expect them to own under one banner. All those analytics are theirs to do with what they wish. And I think it's an unescapable reality of the world we're in now anyway. It's just silent. We can't see it. Although a fun exercise is whenever you actually go to Google permissions, see how many cookies you have agreed to and how many people are tracking you for what ways. That's a bit scary. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not reading all the T's and C's. Neither yeah, exactly. Exactly. And if we're the ones not reading the T's and C's, <laughs> yeah, for sure. we've sold our soul to get convenience. Yeah. I think that's just going to be the way the world is. Uh, there's no point fighting it at this point. Um, yeah, but, but there are positives to that, you know. I mm. think. What, what are the? What do you think are the worst parts of metaverse? Or what can you foresee being the the, the biggest negatives? 
uh, I think the the overall control and ad space thing is going to be, you know, the fact that they're already trying to figure out how they can sell people's visual fields in in this platform is is wild to me. Uh, the the current misuse of the NFT market right now and the digital wearables and the digital assets. There's so many pump and dump schemes right now that is so unsafe mm. um but also you know you, you have to really 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 do your research and not trust influencers on the matter jake paul's in a massive um lawsuit right now for the amount he's done hundreds, really? of, hundreds of millions yeah he's just scammed out of people really? safe, i think safe moon's one of his biggest ones but um yeah it can be used for such good and in such evil uh it's and it's the wild rest right now because it's, it's completely un it's completely you know unregulated but as soon as it is regulated it takes away the whole decentralized thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I suppose us as people are the ones who are responsible <laughs> for it. Yeah, well, you say that, and you absolutely bang on when you say us as people, because like if you remember like a while back, I think it was actually to do with the Cambridge Analytica scandal when mm. when Zuckerberg went up in front of Congress in the US. The questions they were asking him was laughable. It was laughable, <laughs> and and this. But then don't forget the people that were asking him the questions are the one are the lawmakers, the ones who create policies, regulations, yeah, regulate industries. Current but the, Parliament's but, law, they're not ready. But the problem is they don't understand. No. So it's almost like you need a younger, well, a generation that understand it, A, but B, have grown up in it and understand the intricacies at, of all of it. At least have them prep them before they do stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, some <laughs> of the for, questions, mate, were like... For older for older generations, I'm finding the reluctance to learn really boggling. Yeah. When it comes to tech, like, just because, like, I think anything 50 and over is a stereotype, there just becomes a point where they go... I've had enough of learning. It's like, did you learn to drive? Yeah, then you can learn how to use Facebook. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's people who are like 100 years old on their iPad right it's true. now. And or I, there's people who refuse to open a bank it's account. It's true. I, I can't get my head around it. And it's an individualistic thing. It's a thing. mindset thing. It's a mindset thing. Like, for my dad, for example, like he, he still has... Have you seen my dad's phone? On his, yeah. on his little side pocket. Yeah. He's got like this Nokia... Oh, sh- uh, the phone's like 10 pounds, right? Yeah. It's got snake on it. Now, Big up snake. But big up snake, but snake in colour. Oh, okay. Mate, it's it. That's naughty. <laughs> okay. And and when I say to my, and he literally carries it in like a pouch around with him, right? And I'm like, and my, and my dad rings me. He he'll always and don't get me wrong, I still respect the phone call, of course. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes I'm like, dad, look, but he goes, oh, you never answer my call. I'm like, dad, but sometimes I'm busy. Can you can you not like, WhatsApp me? But Send I remember, me a voice note. Yeah. But yeah. then remember, he hasn't got WhatsApp. <laughs> so he's finally got a tablet, but he only will use that tablet in the evenings. But mm. Like when I talk, as far as my dad's text goes, like he's blown away that this little ten pound phone has an FM radio on it. He's <laughs> blown away. So, yeah. so basically, what I think I'm trying to say with that is like he's sixty five, but yeah. then I do know sixty five year olds, six year olds who yeah. are actually pretty awesome with tech. Yeah, because you that sometimes it's it this can be for wholesome reasons, right? So you can have a wholesome individual that does not want to learn about tech. Yeah, you have the right to not want to mess around with tech. It's a scary world anyway. Just don't worry about it. But the people who are in charge of our daily lives need to not have this refusal to learn. That's what scares me the most. Because yeah. I'm I'm never actually going to respect whoever it is on the other end being an absolute wallet, yeah. asking stupid questions. <laughs> I'm like, I could run the country better than you. Yeah. It's like that that needs to be regulated at the highest level. Like if if, if you look like you're going to croak any minute, I need you off that stand and I need someone it's else. It's so true. <laughs> I need so, someone else who's in. There I should be age limits yeah, on poli- yeah. politics. Like, I think the funniest question I heard in that, when that, in that Congress system was, so Mark, how does Facebook make money if... <laughs> You, your users don't pay to be on there. And the glasses came down, no, like no, some sort of con artist. Yeah. No, no, and then no. Mark looks at, looks looks around. He's like, uh, "Rerun ads." <laughs> <laughs> I reckon. And I'm just there, like, you can't believe it. These are the top bloody US Congress people trying to regulate a set so they start understand. You could have looked like I'm in a book and found out. Like, yeah, <laughs> you could have found out the old school way. Yeah, um, it's just clear they don't care. And, yeah, you know, that'll, that'll make me not care about anything they do. But then again, that's that's the states. So I'm not sure we've been as obviously bad, but I think there still is a, a big a big gap when yeah. it comes to understanding the new world of tech and how to make people safe on, yeah. especially via the NFTs and crypto. Um, but I still think crypto has one of the potentials to kind of free us all, really, in that regard. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially when we see what can happen to economies and petrol prices when people, yeah. when old people start wars. Looking at you, Putin. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> It is what it is. Yeah, and let's let's talk B2B marketing quick. Like in the metaverse, any predictions on how that might look? I think the metaverse will take longer to get to the point of use than people think it will, purely yeah. because of technological availability. Uh, unless they can find a way to make people interact with it with their phones right now and a two D interface and start them somewhere. 
Because if I ask 90% of people and anyone at home, go on the metaverse right now, how do you do it? Mm. Yeah, exactly. I, I, even I don't know. <laughs> it's yeah. like, uh, but if I got the Oculus headset, I'm sure Facebook can then give me the access. So that access to technology is going to be massive. So that's going to take a long time to make the tech good enough and cheap enough for mass adoption. So I don't think we'll see the metaverse really come through for like another 10 years minimum. Really? Yeah, because you've got to have find out some way to make these parts cheaper. They can't even get PlayStations out on time because there's a chip shortage. You think they're going to be able to get next level VR headsets out? Yeah. That like, and maybe they'll be able to do it with their phone, but then your field of vision is limited to just this this bar. Yeah. So the immersion that they want is not available. So that's the hard thing that Facebook can have to master. Do you, do you think there'll come a time when, like, I know obviously Facebook's kind of, they're, they're really hedging their bets on Metaverse, right? You can hmm. see that. But like, do you think there'll come a time when Facebook, because they just absolutely destroyed the platform, becomes so broken that people, like, just leave and just don't... Because if, once again, if that, if It's that, already happening. Yeah, because if that drops and drops and drops and drops and drops, at some point... Mm. they'll have to charge maybe to be to use the platform that, that'll be the day which, will, which will be um, game over yeah. because be, there's like everyone's just flocking away right and they better make sure they buy the platforms that are doing it well and don't tank them because that's yeah. what they have been doing yeah. as well as secure WhatsApp and Instagram because they already know that Facebook is is now MySpace and Instagram is now Facebook so <laughs> they've got to figure out the next step mm. and the, the the rise of TikTok has been a, such an un unprecedented competitor for them I don't think they know what to do with it it's almost accelerated their timelines what they have to do with the metaverse like, yeah. expansion and I don't think they'll have the time to do it personally I think we'll see a period where like Facebook uses almost disappears for like five years and then the metaverse thing is what will, what will come out um, but again it still has its use cases it still has loads of users but if you looked at those two point something billion users I guarantee you I know even a quarter of them are active I think there's just a lot of people that just have it. Mm. Um, and even Instagram's getting to that stage. It's hitting a top level of maturity, whereas you know TikTok has reached its first stride and is past its first golden age, which anyone that needs to start a TikTok account do it like yesterday because it just it just needs to happen. Yeah. Um, and the easiest way to describe it, if you've never downloaded it, it's Twitter for the spoken word. There you go. Now yeah. just tweet stuff <laughs> with your mouth, and that's how you use TikTok. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. It, I like that. It, it, so, it's, so let's it's zoom true. out a little bit. So obviously, we, I know we, we've been living in like you know, we talk a lot of marketing platforms, mm. etc. What's coming? So let, I want to talk about James Gale, the business owner. Okay, Who, this guy. So 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 <laughs> first first of all, like you know, starting out in COVID, mm. difficult decision, I suppose, or was it really because you replace your income? But like thinking, is this going to last? What's what's life like? So for anyone watching this who might be have the same enthusiasm and passion for social as you do mm. and would love to start their own gig like what's mm. it actually like because i think one of the things that um especially on instagram and that's what you were saying about the whole instagram look having to look perfect all the time yep. especially when it comes to when you start falling into that algorithm when you go on your search previews like all you can see is bloody ceos Mm. Rolexes, Lamborghinis and stuff. Yep. Like, what's it actually like then life of James Gale? Very stressful, not going to lie. <laughs> uh, we're still at a, a startup-like stage, but we're evolving. We're learning and developing new processes. We're training people for different positions. It's it's something where you're never ready to be as the CEO type person. Um, you know, you're never really ready to do it. It's like having a baby. It's like anytime you even think of taking a step back, it tries to off itself. So you're like, oh, let me get yeah. that back. Um, you know, that's kind of the reality. Not to put people off, but <laughs> yeah. the realities of it. But I think the reality is important. It's not about putting people off. It's like, because I do worry that there's too much of an image these days. We promote success a lot, mm. but no one promotes like what you have to go to to get there. Like, you know, me and, me and Chris are yeah. pretty honest, and for years we didn't pay ourselves. Mm. Then when we did, it was like, what, 200 a quid a month? Slog. Long slog. You know, yeah. and... Just keep enough to keep the lights on. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm in the same position. I mean, don't get wrong, unless you've got loads of money behind you that you can just get backed and like from day one, you can afford yeah, I mean, a massive Yeah, if you start a business that gets funding, that's that's Yeah, and that's Build that into your, your finance. But I'm, I'm talking ground up stuff. So like, what what have been the biggest challenges for you as a business owner mm. in, in the short time you've been going? How long have you been going now? About a year and a bit? A year and seven months. Yeah, nice. No, so about half the time we've been going. Mm. Yeah. So the biggest challenge for me is one, learning how to do anything HR, bringing people <laughs> on and just how... I know we had a few calls, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> HMRC and how taxes work. 
just not explained really at any stage ever and i'm very lucky that i am an ecosystem like barclays eagle labs where i can find resources and people just go yeah. hold on what what is that because <laughs> you know i started a sole trader and then we evolved we rapidly grew so i had to switch to limited but then those lines blurred between what you have to do for each and you know what was the best one to even start with it was probably right to start a sole trader for tax reasons and then move into limited but it, yeah just the whole blurring of the situation while trying to you know, teach you learn your first employees uh, deliver the work to clients and try and get to the level of clients you need to one thing that's not talked about enough is the constant pressure to keep your sales pipeline building yeah. while having to wear all the other hats there's just this anxiety of like okay my pipeline's looking all right I need them over on the actual sign up bit. Yeah. And you just kind of stare at your partner. Like, every every day you get more nervous that one hasn't moved over to another. And there's that, the constant, because I've been asking a lot of other business owners as well, it's going longer than me. And I'm like, does that anxiety ever go away? And they look at me and go, nah, mate. It <laughs> doesn't. Like, God right. damn it. Um, so you do have to, like, almost, when you take the journey, have this acceptance that there's always going to be this nervousness. Mm -hmm. You're always going to feel like it's all on you. So you have to rely on networks and just have chats like this and like, you know, to be real with other people because you, you can't do it yeah. alone hundred percent. And even if it's an employee at first, bring them into your inner circle to get some support because yeah, trying to do it all Superman style and think everything's okay is a highway for disaster. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. And that's interesting you say that about the whole sales pop line because you're so right, especially when you're looking to scale, like, mm. and that, what's, what's life like James DeGale? the salesperson, yeah. not not the marketeer. Like in terms of like, you know, and you, it's interesting because you're right, you, you have to wear all those other hats. Mm. And, I, and I think it gets slightly easier when you get more team members, mm. but then it only gets really easy, I suppose, when you've got great senior leadership people, but we're not there yet. You mm. know, we, we know where we want to be and we know, we know roughly when we're going to install that management layer just to like mm. help out with freeing up to focus on the, the big picture stuff. Yeah. But like, do you find that sometimes, because like there's such sometimes it's difficult to persuade, especially the more established businesses, yeah. that they've got to be a bit more open with their organic social. Mm -hmm. Like, do you find that you have to sometimes default to like older ways just to like get that pipeline over the line, just to keep lights off for another month? Sometimes, oh, like our pipeline is entirely inbound right now. I'd yeah. say like I have fully dedicated to the post like a creator approach, and people come to us, which it was a risky thing at first, and it's things like having been available on Fiverr Pro and our website being active and our LinkedIn are our only three marketing channels. I've I'm not done, I think I've done some outreach via LinkedIn DMs, but that's as far as, far as it's gone from traditional sales point of view. Um, so it, it has worked. It's just, it takes longer. And I've been kicking it old school a lot more with relationship building because I want to work with large scale corporates, public sector, things like that, because they're the ones in the most need mm. to do this. And they're the ones I can speak the language of yeah. Uh, and go, look, I know this is scary, but look what we've done for X. And, you know, you know full well just from what's in your pocket, you know it's true. And I just need to unlock that for you because there's no one else has been there to help you with this. That's what I'm trying to do. So sometimes I'm building relationships like four, five, six months of just being there as a resource to help. And then eventually they go, we've got something for you. Yeah. Like that's, that's how I started working with the council. It, it took months and months for that to actually come to fruition. Uh, so for me, that's a long ass, unscalable, yeah. like uh, I couldn't do that for everything. But I'm being very selective and treating things more like and an ABM campaign with, right? um, to make sure I get high, high yeah. quality stuff. Because I want us to be known as a corporate transformation specialist because that's where my background comes from. And that's what I think can get the, the biggest transform over. Because if you take this approach from a startup, they are an immediate lead, like lead need, really. Uh, you can't, you have to do it yourself personally if you're going to take the approach we have. But if a startup approach, I'm like, it's probably not the stage for you to be here yet. Yeah. Um, and But take everything I've taught you and do it now yourself and then come to us later when you need support to someone to carry on the ethos. But yeah, it's been a lot of old school relationship building and extending my networking via video. So I'm trying to capture all the good moments like this, clip them and put them out yeah. so people can get the vibe of what it's like to be in a meeting with me. And just put that in perspective. So James is the only guest you've had so far who's actually brought his own camera <laughs> and brought his own mic. But 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 genius. Yeah, I, because I because that, need a con way to that content, content engine just churns and churns and churns and churns yeah. and churns, right? Yeah, it wasn't even my idea. I found it off of TikTok. There's a creator called JT Barrett that does something similar, but he focuses on helping people become creators and then teaches them how to get deals from brands. And he was just putting his phone up there and recording his Zoom sessions with some of his clients. I thought it was bloody genius. And, you know, 
still like an artist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just, yeah. It's just the way it has to be done. Yeah. And again, the US guys are killing it on TikTok, but the UK market is still very much unclaimed. Uh, and I need to go hard and double down on it. But it's you know, yeah, when you wear so sure. many hats, you have to prioritize it's, things. You're and, right. And, and so if you could jump in the time machine then fly back a year seven months down back you know back back in time when you literally like with days are mm. you know what what would you tap yourself on the shoulder and say to yourself back then and, and I'm not talking about regrets really I'm just talking about is there, is there things that you'd like say just don't do that bit <laughs> I'd say the things like the don't or do, that. do fucking more of that <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'd probably say do more content I think double down on TikTok earlier on in lockdown one that and use that as the main driver instead of LinkedIn. Yeah. So I kicked old school and went, you know what, I'm probably going to get more of a direct ROI out of, TikTok, out of LinkedIn than I am TikTok. Um, and now end up being the person that talks about TikTok all the time. I wish my TikTok following was larger. But then again, I'm only posting to it like once a week right now because I yeah. don't take my own advice. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it, it is that. And it also probably try and find a co-founder. I must admit, it's, really? it's stressful having to do this yourself. Yeah, uh, it, it is. It's really hard. Or and I've I've my for that. And this is why I always say to you, like, just you can just call us whenever because, mm. like, I I think me and Chris are very lucky in the sense that we've got. Yeah. This just sounds so like, but we got each other. <laughs> it's like you know when you just no, hate no, a mate. couple that are getting on really well. It <laughs> is, and, 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 and it is like, and in a weird way. I don't know how this comes across, but it is a bit like a relationship, right? You, you do have to yeah, work at yeah. it. And like, seriously, it's <laughs> just coming across. Clip that. <laughs> but yeah, but like, you know, one thing we always, one one thing, you know, I've seen other business partnerships and so, mm. so we've seen some really rocky ones. Yeah. But one thing I love about me and Chris is like, if there's anything that's on my mind or on his mind, mm. the rule is just say it. Just say it. Yeah. No matter how offensive you might think it's coming across. You need an outlet. You do, yeah, yeah. Uh, and sometimes it's about each other. Mm. Like there's been times when Chris really got my nose about something. I've said that to him. Same with him. Yeah, but then it's great. You have, you have your like. Is, we, we've never had an argument, really, no. have we? You need to treat a business relationship like you would. Mm. You have a half, yeah. yeah, yeah. You need to. You need to. Yeah. That, that building up. If you don't talk about things, and as Josh said, I'll say uh, you're more fiery than me, though. Yeah, I definitely am. <laughs> I've, I've seen times. I've seen him walk out of the office. I'm like, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, he's pissed off at that. He'll come back. They always yeah. do. But, then, but you laugh. Like ten minutes later, it's like right. Can we go up? <laughs> yeah. but it's that whole you know you've got to treat it like a relationship you've got to yeah. you've kind of got to have that communication yeah. and you've got to be able to talk out problems yeah. yeah. otherwise just resentment builds up yeah. like, like Josh said we've, we've seen it with other, yeah. other business yeah. partners but that yeah. resentment does build up mm. and it just doesn't work it does not work fundamentally yeah. Yeah. and imagine that in the solo sense that the, you're almost hard on yourself to the point where all the anger yeah. any mistake that happens even if it wasn't you you put on yourself and yeah. you build this internal tank of and then what I found was is that I get any mistake multiplies for me until the point where I'm like ultra mad at myself and then I'll just hold it in the emotions Uh, and then I'm like but then I'll get task overwhelm off the back of it and then it stops me from actually being productive and I'm like Christ Uh, so I I need to figure out a way to exercise that that. and I'm I'm, I'm lucky my mum's done you also need like a a genuine like a genuine support network who have your best interests at heart yeah, and some, yeah. Like, I've always wanted more than support network because most of the time like, I can talk to someone, yeah, but they can't yeah. help me. Yeah, mate, I know and that I know is the, the main thing. I know like, the oh my god, feeling. I've got this huge problem. All, and, and I, the, all I need is one thing. The yeah, challenge like, is the, the bigger your business <laughs> gets, everyone will listen to you, mate. You're a nice guy. A- anyone will give you a, a shoulders cry on. Yeah, but the problem is, is like, all right, who can I open this all up to, and they can actually come back and give me great advice? Because mm. the bigger your business gets, that that pool of people. Whether it's family, friends, get smaller and smaller and smaller because yeah. unfortunately they haven't done what you're doing yeah. and they're not on the journey you're on. Yeah, you have to make. So it's almost like you've got to find new people to like yeah. have that bond with. Like we, we we're quite lucky, I think. You know, we've got three or four highly, highly, highly successful people that mm. we know who we'd also count as a friend, mm. and they're very down to earth as well. Yeah. So you can have that genuine, but that but I think that's what you need as you get bigger, if that makes sense. Yeah, and yeah, you, know, you have to create it in other ways. So yeah. weirdly enough, early days, specifically when I was just in my bedroom, I'd have to build up parasocial bonds with like people who knew what they were doing that I could learn from. So Stephen Bartlett, like um, the guy that runs Refine Labs, his name escapes me, like Chris something. You know, it's I was like, okay, how many people can I learn from and feel like they're like my mentor or something? It's and then true. eventually do you may... find mentors, and this is why Eagle Labs. Is so yeah, who was I obsessed with? Grant Cardone. Grant Cardone. Be obsessed or be average. One be of my obsessed, be average. Ten X rule, sell or be sold. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I, 
I do not use any Grant Cardone sales methodology because <laughs> I think it's so 80s. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. sign here and here. He, he's corny, but when you need him in moments yeah. of motivation, he's there. Like, uh, but I think <laughs> I, I read, I listened to uh, the sellers, no, so the closers guide to something is like 100 closes. Mm. And it's basically how to deal with objections and rebuttals. Yeah. One of them was so, right, prospect says, I can't afford it. Yeah. Yeah, just do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, well, okay, let's see how we translate this. And I was like, right, so imagine I'm selling to James. James says, Josh, I can't afford it. And I'm just like, just do it anyway. Yeah. But Josh, I can't afford it. Take a risk, put uh, on a credit card. Do it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But, I, but I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm yeah, with you. Because you have to start somewhere. And yeah. Like that, for me, that was the, the practical way I solved that issue. And this is why I actually try and make so much content. Uh, although I don't get to document, I do want to evolve into a weekly vlog yeah. at some point so people can see the proper realities of things. Um, but like, um, I think people often get that part confused. They're like, yeah. they'll find like a, a, a loss or something that they can, or a mistake that they can make this like wanky LinkedIn a post about every now and then. Yeah. And I'm like, that's not really opening up. Like, mm. yeah, it, it's, it's more like you know, filming a vlog and ah, I tripped over a pebble or something. Like, yeah, just yeah. the little things to show you're human more than like, oh my god, I. I lost my entire business this way. Here's how I recovered it. Because it almost turns into a humble brag. And it's like, it's not helpful to me. Yeah, that's just yeah. self-posturing. Yeah. Uh, so I think, again, that's another way authenticity. But on the flip side of that as well, like, I'm seeing a lot of rise in content that's like, I don't, I don't know the best way to word this, where it's like, do you know what I'm going? I know exactly what you're talking about before you've even mentioned it. Can you, can you say it before I do? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's content where it's like, look how bad I've had it. Yeah. And I, and I I walk a very fine line with that one, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. but and and the reason I walk a fine line with that because I a lot of it I respect, yeah. But we have to under we have to ask ourselves the question: What is the purpose of us posting that content? Is it to raise awareness and try to actually level with people mm-hmm. to say, look, you're not the only one in this, yeah? Or is it because we know we're probably gonna get a load of likes on this, yeah? And, and get a load of comments and unfortunately on this. it's like with thumb, uh, youtube thumbnails the clickbait still works mm. and you know some people will post it for functional reasons and you know if you're honest about that i respect it but i, I most of the time i can't stand it i'm like yeah you know be useful for once don't just tell me about how successful you are yeah um, yeah because you know yeah. that's not you're used to me mm. um <laughs> yeah because the people that put themselves out tell the story of how they were successful but also give you other actionable advice and tell the honest story from end to end not just the the win part mm. yeah and that's why yeah. people like Stephen bartlett win all the time yeah because he's just honest with it yeah. and you know that extreme honesty is going to become a massive trend i yeah. think and just sharing it in different ways and so from the James DeGale playbook so far, yeah. what are your top things to people watching this who are starting a business tomorrow, just on the journey you've been on? S- starting a business tomorrow, don't open a Facebook page, wherever you do, redundant. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe make it so you can do automated posting for Instagram. Um, whenever you want to f- pick your social channels, don't. there's two schools of camp, be on everything or be on just one thing do a middle ground, pick a top three and put it in hierarchy of what's most important to you. So for us, it's LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, and then you can figure out what content you'll make. Um, Think of your social media in a far simpler way. Monday to Friday, what original series are you making to educate, inspire, entertain? And think of it in that way. Drive via personal brand first, be honest with people, be open with people and give them something useful. Even if it, no matter what form it takes, video is always going to be preferable because it's the sign of analytics and it is the parasocial bond people will build up with you when they're so familiar with your content and they trust it. So for me, that's that's a big one. A clear customer journey and a clear offering. Don't, don't convolute it. Have a simple problem. Solve it. Classic entrepreneur style. And yeah, just, just be yourself and have a support network how you can, but try and have more of a practical support network because sometimes people just listening to you, eventually you'll just be like, I don't want you, your ears. I want results. Like yeah, I, I need yeah. help. Uh, so make sure you put yourself in a position to be helped or to help others and treat every sales call, especially if you're B2B service, more like a diagnostic for them. Make it all about them. Make everything constantly about your customer. And then they're like, oh my God, that's so valuable. Can I please work with you? Yeah. Then the demand comes to you instead of you going, look, I, I'll do this, this, this. I, I'm, I'm amazing. I can do it all buy and it's like they don't yeah but when you completely blow their mind with potential knowledge and the the potential of their brand and what it could be that is when they they go oh my god this has to be the company so be yourself and learn to communicate for me i think the reason we've gotten so far so quickly is this i i think i can't communicate via the written word i'm naff at school always was classical entrepreneur story right uh but my ability to talk on camera 
has helped me massively i think so anyone yeah. that can must so that would probably be my end to end love that so guys look some fire in the booth right there <laughs> so guys look episode four break the mold james gale it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show thank you thank there's you been guys. lots of gems there and you know like like all the reason we run this podcast is this is not aimed at I suppose really established business owners. We're, we're, we're calling out to the young hustlers out there who, who are trying to break in. That's what it's all about. And this is why we bring in some some people who, who are starting to either they're well along that journey or they're just starting out and they're seeing some success. But even with James and that brain of his, you can see already kind of where he's going to, going to be going. So, James, thank you for your time. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Pleasure you. to see you, mate. Appreciate you. And I'll see you soon. Good Thanks, James. guys.